uh, let's talk about uh, this thing called strong and weak ties. And for this, I'm I'm really grateful for the book by uh, Easley and Kleinberg, and all the material in this uh, in this today's discussion and these slides is taken from there. Okay, just to give you again, you know, sort of a, a broader perspective, right? If you think about a network, if you think of the network as a whole, it's it's like one one graph as a whole. But at the same time, what it also lets you do is if you zoom into any node, you actually happen to know what is happening at every node, right? So if you want to think of it as a process or if you want to think of it as people, like there is every individual, individual is doing something. But when you zoom out, you see the society, something is happening at the societal level based on whatever actions are happening at an individual level. So a network is, 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 a, very, is a very neat framework which allows you to understand the impact of the local on the global and vice versa in, in, in very precise ways. Yeah. Um, so, th there, so there are local things that will have a global effect and then there will be something global which will have effect on the, on the local stuff. Okay. And, and of course I am saying this kind of just, it may sound vague right now, but I want to say this out at the front because as we go through this with this thing at the back of your mind, uh, hopefully this will you know kind of be made evident to you through through what we're going to discuss next so in the next few slides we'll also understand how information flows through a network okay we will understand how different uh, nodes we can play you know if they're based like i said based on the location within the network sort of is it central is it non central and things like that does it make a difference on on what role they are going to play yeah hopefully i'll be able to convince you that yes it matters and exactly how it matters and and just based on how something starts off how that's going to even change and evolve also uh, matters so how the future shape of a network is going to look like depends on what the current shape of the network is hopefully you know I'll, I'll i'll be able to you know we'll be able to see uh, some of these things quite clearly yeah that's the hope so um, so granovetter was a social scientist and this is like you know really really old paper which got a lot of citations much more recently i mean relatively recently compared to when the paper was written Okay, so he actually set out to just uh, you know doing a survey about how people find jobs. Okay, it was a simple, seemingly simple uh, survey. And what he found when he talked to people was that they said, "Yeah, I found a job through personal contact." Now this is like more than a hundred years before today, more than a hundred years. And but they all said, kind of one thing kind of stood out that many of them actually said through personal contacts, but they said acquaintances, not friends, okay? It did not say friends, they said acquaintances. And of course, so our question is, okay, so where does the graph come into the picture? Yeah? Where does the graph come into the picture? So this leads us to ask this fact that, you know, we're going to talk about friendships versus acquaintances tells us, okay, let's take a step back. Let's understand what is all this stuff. What is a friendship? Yeah. What is this? So let's understand this. So the question is, how are friendships formed? Okay. So one thing is, of course, now you guys all came to this ACM winter school and many of you end up becoming friends. So that's one way friendships are formed. Yeah. So because of a common interest, you ended up becoming friends, yeah. But before we, but I'm going to just push us one step further and say, well, okay, but I want to see the graph in the midst of this. Okay, so one thing is that, okay, so no, and in fact, this is fine. So maybe because of a common interest, you both came to the same place and an edge was formed. But my question to you is, I agree, what are other ways in which friendships are formed? Like, 
person from one group and another person from another group become friends, then it may be that the whole group yeah, but how would that happen? So, so let's say the so there are two groups, right? Let's say there are two groups. Let's say there are two groups, right? And and she befriended him, so they became friends. How did they become friends? They became friends with this fact that they both came to the ACM into school. Huh. Now what happens? Now, like his friends and her friends may also become friends. Uh, why? Because they're here. Not necessarily. How then? How then? That's the question. So we understand this. You all had a common interest. You all came, you all joined a judo club or you joined swimming, you became friends. I get that. That's one way. What other ways do we become friends? What do you mean? So let's forget about acquaintances. Let's just say there was only one thing, this friendships. See your name again, please. Sharon. Sharon. Yes, please. Right? Now do you see graph? So Sharon is a vertex. She has edges with B and C. And what does that cause? There was no edge between B and C. And Sharon is causing the edge between B and C to be formed. Right? Right? So this is clearly uh, another way which we can see inside the graph. So for example, the fact that you all came to winter school, currently this graph is not showing. But the fact, suppose here, suppose in fact, B is Sharon, right? And G is Disha, and F is Amit. And in the future, if G and F have a line, then we know. Yeah? All right. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. True. True. Some before others. Some before others. So, one way to think about it is that all the things that are open triangles will close first. So, I can't see that G and C will become friends the first thing. So, first maybe GF will become, then BC will become. Open. So, B, one of, so BC will form, GF will form, then GC will form. Does that make sense? Right? But you are also right that if B and D have two common friends, yes, Dhruvi. Sir, I didn't get that. How is what she said and what he said different? Different. What she is saying is, Sharon is B, I am G, Disha is F. So, because she introduces us, Disha and I become friends, so edge between G and F is formed. Yeah, right? Now, huh, sorry, you were? She introduced because you are here. No, she, let's say that some, no, let's even say that she is in Kotayam and I am in Ahmedabad. Even then, she is a friend of mine. So, even then, she may say that, oh, you know, but uh, I, I think it makes sense for you to be introduced. So, she may introduce us over email. But, yes, sorry, one second. Huh? Let me answer the second part. What he is saying instead is, that the chances of B and D are going to get increased because not only Sharon is a common friend, but even, pardon, what's her name, please? Neetu. is also a common friend. So either she may introduce or so the likelihood of us getting introduced doubles. That's the point he's making. Slightly different point. Yes, Agnesh. Sir, like, like, uh, my one of my classmates is A. So, she and Sharon are friends. Yeah, so here's a real life example. I'm sure all of you have experienced this, right? Everywhere, right? This is this is real stuff. Yeah, it should be, I mean, I'm hoping that everything that we talk about in my part is going to just be obvious to you. Yeah? Thanks, thanks for that, Yagnish. Okay, so. Yeah, so exactly as, uh, as she said, so what happens is that, what's going on here? So maybe, you know, so Sharon is introducing her friends to each other, friends who have not previously met, right? And everybody seems to be doing it, not just Sharon. Yeah? 
So what's going on? So if two people in a social network have a friend in common, then there is an increased likelihood that they will become friends themselves at some point in the future. Right? What is the practical reason why this may not happen? Is if Sharon thinks it's not a good idea to introduce Amit and Disha because they don't really have common interests. Right? Okay. Now, so something we just talked about before because there was a need to talk about it. Now it is even more, it's just something you, we've already talked about. Let me say it again, right? So what is happening? People, people are acting in a way so that their friends become friends. So clustering coefficient actually measures, it actually measures how many of my friends are friends? But that's just a measure. But what we are saying is people are acting in a way that has a particular effect on the clustering coefficient. People are acting in a way that is changing their clustering coefficient. Yes? Okay. So we can say that in a social network, there will be a tendency to increase clustering coefficient. And Priyam, as you were saying, in the end, looks like everybody should come to know each other. Provided, you know, everybody thinks that it's, it makes sense to introduce these two people and if this really happens in an extreme sense, right? But, but it makes sense what he's saying, that in an extreme sense, this is kind of what we are, we are saying. So I don't need to go over this. You guys know this? Yeah. Once again, if I'm looking at the clustering coefficient of the red guy, I, right? I'm only interested in all the edges among the blue guys. I'm not interested in the edges that the red is connected with the blue. Because I want to know how many friends of I are friends of each other, right? So I actually, after just identifying the neighbors, I gets out of the picture. Now the fact that there are four friends means that uh, there are the maximum possible number of edges among those four is six, and how many edges there actually are will decide what the clustering coefficient is. Okay, right? So <clears throat> to say it, you know, in more clearer terms, even if it's informal, is that it's a fraction of the pairs of A's friends that are connected to each other by edges. So if I'm looking at A, looking at all of A's friends, then how many pairs of them are connected to each other? That fraction is the clustering coefficient. Okay. It is also of a no day can also be, clustering coefficient can also be defined as a probability that two randomly selected friends of A our friends saying the same thing in different words. So the more the triadic closure is operating, the higher the clustering coefficient will be. So like I'm saying, people are first, one part is that the dynamic part, the people are like, introduce, introduce, that's the dynamic part. Static part, I take a picture, what is the clustering coefficient? I take another picture, take another picture, take snapshots. Over time, I see that the clustering coefficient is increasing. Yeah. Sorry. Right? And why, why does this happen? I shouldn't have showed that. <laughs> why, does, why does it happen? Why does it happen? Why would Sharon want to introduce this shiny? Why? Socially, why do you want to? Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Maybe she will benefit from that friendship. Maybe she will benefit from that friendship. I mean, like, like she has to, let's say, uh, A, B, and A, C are friends, then A has to spend time with B, and A also has to spend time with C. Instead of spending um, this joint time, they can just spend time here, spend their time together. So that you know, Fair enough. Resources. Yeah. Well, Meer, say your point again. Maybe she will benefit from that. Benefit from this. Uh, so Ha, so this is what he said. Yeah. So that relationship will balance out. So she might have both the positive and the Yeah. So she'll have. 
So, which what you are saying is that uh, the benefit is coming from the fact that if she has to watch the same movie with her and then the same movie with me, that makes no sense. Let me take both of them together and watch this movie because I'm not going to watch this movie twice. Kind of thing, which is what, right? That's what you are saying. That's what it is. Any other reasons? Say that again. Yeah. So now that I, I see that Disha has been introduced by Shen, I'll say, oh, you know, she must be a cool girl, good girl, because she's a good, you know, she's a friend of a friend of mine. So I'll tend to implicitly trust her, uh, and vice versa, based on who's introducing us, right? So these are the reasons why, uh, number one, somebody will do this, why Sharon will do it. Number two, why we are likely to, why we are more likely to remain friends is because of the reason that Sharon just said. Right? So that's what's going on. <clears throat> so trusting and incentive, right? Incentive is kind of what uh, Mihir and Ujan are saying and trusting is what Sharon said. Are we good? Make sense? Cool. So, so where were we? So we first started, I'm, I'm sorry for the small font, but, but just listen to me, just don't, don't bother about what you, 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 whether you cannot read there. So we said that, what have we said so far? Granovita went and did a study. He found that acquaintances rather than friends are helpful in finding jobs. And so that brought us to the question, first of all, what are friendships? And so then we went to say, okay, what are friendships? How are they formed? That's all where we went. And we said that, well, the fact is that triadic closures are happening, right? And that's happening because people are into, why are people introducing? Because of the reasons we just said. And that's what it is, right? Now, we're still trying to do, eventually where we want to get is we want to differentiate between uh, friends and acquaintances. So first we want to understand what friendships are and slowly we'll figure out what acquaintances might be. Right? So here is a broad idea. Now, with, before saying how, how somebody may become an acquaintance or not, let's just understand why is it likely that this guy said that, you know, we have got it through a personal contact, but that fellow is not really a close friend, he's just an acquaintance or she's just an acquaintance. Right? Because actually close friends that we have, we talk to them frequently and share information more frequently with them. Actually, it's rarely that a close friend will tell you something that you don't already know because you're talking practically on a daily basis, right? And um, right, yeah. Now let's come to another thing, and here's a definition from graph theory, right? And again, we will see how again we'll take a formal definition. And we'll see how we will change it a little bit to suit our needs based on the practical application. Yeah. So what is the edge AB is called a bridge. Why is it called a bridge? If you, if you, if you cut it, it will disconnect the graph. It will increase the number of components in the graph. So this is a bridge, right? Um, so we are saying, but in real social networks, imagine you have like millions of edges, actually billions of edges and millions of nodes. Is bridge a practical definition? Do you think there are bridges? Maybe there are bridges. They are sparse, but we also saw that they have giant components, yes. which means that 80% of the thing with millions of edges is still kind of this connected. So, so the so this already the fact that we know that there are giant components means that the chance of finding a bridge there is pretty low, at least in that 80% of the graph. Yeah. So, so what this tells us bridge is a is a good definition for a theoretical setting. But what am I looking for? I'm looking for a definition. What is a, okay, so what is a bridge? Bridge is something which if I cut, it will disconnect the graph. But this again, just like the definition of clique and star, we, from clique we went to dense, relaxing it. From stars we went to imperfect stars, we got starness value. So my question is, how, how can I, how should I change the definition of a bridge so that it still kind of has its meaning, 
But if I keep it so crisp, it's going to become useless to me. Does the, does the motivation make sense? Something like community centers. Maybe. Why would there be bridges? Um, like, um, there's a community center around one node and another community center around another node. And if they are connected, then... Then that thing is a bridge. Yeah. Right? So how would we... Correct. Okay. I mean, intuitively that mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right? Now what we see is that can we try to formalize this a little bit? So let me say this again. A bridge means if I cut, what happens? Disconnected, right? Disconnected means what is the distance between these parts? Infinite. Hint, right? Number of parts will definitely get reduced. How? What do you mean by amount? Like the number of shortest parts passing through the tail. Number doesn't matter. Sorry, hold, hold on one second. Sorry. So, if we have uh, two uh, communities and uh, so, so two uh, nodes. Two nodes and uh, there is this uh, edge between them. If I increase, if I cut that uh, edge, then the distance between these two nodes will increase a lot. Does that make sense? Was somebody going to say something else here? Did I miss somebody? Right? So now what happens is, I am saying the distance when I cut it became infinite. Hmm. Okay. But in practical sense, if it somehow becomes quite large, like you said, large enough, hmm. then it's practically it was a bridge. Okay. Right? Hmm. So that sounds like a decent, very good relaxation hmm. of the very stringent notion of a bridge. Are you with me? Are you with him? Yeah? yeah. All right. All right. So. So we have something called, we'll call it local bridge. Okay? Because a bridge, technically a bridge would have to disconnect it. Yeah. Right? And it's a global no thing because we cut it, the thing should get disconnected. So let's introduce a new term which we'll call local bridge. And we will say that AB is a local bridge because if you remove this, then the distance between the A and B go increases from 1 to whatever it increases to. Right? Now, now it's really back to us. How much? 3. 4, 27, 39, what? Right? So, so, okay, so let's say it should increase. Yeah? And we will, we will really figure out what we want it to be. Uh, I'm taking words now. What is a good number? Let's just see. What's a good number? 3? Kathan says 3. How many for 3? Three? 3, going 1, going 2. 3. 4? Would be a good number, so okay. So one thing is, do you want to make it depend on the diameter of the? Yes, sorry. Oh, you're talking of this graph? No, I want it. I want. I want a general. Yes, yeah, sorry. It could be a relative notion. Okay. So hold on to that thought. It could be a relative notion. Yeah. So here we'll go with Kathan's definition for the for today's uh, for today's discussion. But that's a good point. Hold on to that thought, right? So maybe in, in some other thing that we encounter, maybe making it a relative notion makes sense. But that, but here is a thought. I mean, here's a counterpoint. The fact that the diameter is large or less doesn't tell you what the average path length is. So should it be driven by the diameter or should that be dependent upon what the average path lengths are? I'm, I'm just saying, right? So the point is, Yes, we can come upon multiple alternative reasonable definitions based on what makes sense to you in your setting. Okay? For now, we will go with Kathan's definition that if it is more than 2, it is a bridge. I cut it, distance between A and B becomes 3 or 4 or 5 or whatever, then the, that edge A and B is a local bridge. That is what we are going with. Okay? Now, now, now out of the blue, I am going to pull a rabbit out of the hat and just call it this. Okay, so, so just bear with me and everything will become clear. Okay, so we got the local bridge part. Okay, now, Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Let's. I, I think we can handle this. I think we can handle this. So let's say that. Let's say that. Uh, okay. Let's say that every every edge will be labeled as strong or weak based on uh, the person I ask. So I'll go to Pujan and say, okay, how is your your relationship with Mano? Is it strong or weak? So he'll say it is weak. For now, we'll for now we'll just assume that if I go and ask Mano the same question, they will both agree on whether it should be stronger. Let's get into that for now. For now, okay. So so now I can go and ask everybody. They will say this is strong, this is weak, this is strong, this is weak, and I can get a a labeling like this. You have a point. Okay. So so let's say I get so basically this is how I'm getting the labels on every edge by asking everybody. Okay. So now I've got a label. Now, now I am going to call, I am going to define something called the strong triadic closure property. What it says is that if a node has two strong friends, going back to Sharon's point. So Sharon is a very good friend of Disha and a very good friend of mine. Then Disha and I at least need to be acquaintances. This is what this guy is saying. This is what this, this sentence is roughly saying. Hmm? So basically, what it's and and we'll see why this is going to be useful. But for now, just go with the flow with me. What it is saying is that if you have two strong friends, then you will at least make the trouble of introducing them so that they are aware of each other's existence, even if they may not become strong friends. I'm not insisting, but come on, they have to be at least introduced if I'm really good friends. That's the point that this is making. Okay. And so, so let's read the formal statement and make sure that we get it. It sinks in. We are saying that this labeling, so I have a graph, SW, SW, all this is written on every edge. And, and I'm saying if a node has two strong links, yeah, then those two neighbors, and if those two neighbors have no edge between them, that means this graph is not satisfying this property. But if every guy I go to, okay, I go to every guy and I see two friends strong, or oh, at least a weakling. I go to another guy, oh, at least a, I do this for everybody. I go to every person, then I look at for every pair of that person's friends, and I see that this property is satisfied, then I'm happy and say, I can say, okay, this graph satisfies the strong triadic closure property. It's a mouthful to speak, that's okay. Yeah, STC, STC, okay. Now, what does it say? It says that if a node edge has edges B and C, then BC edge is especially likely to form, right? Because both are close friends. Come on, then these guys have to be at least acquainted. They have to be aware of each other's existence. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense, yeah, socially. Yes. Uh, say that again. Yeah, yeah, it could be strong, of course. At least a weak tie. At least a weak tie. Hmm. So strong is, of course, totally allowed. Yeah. So there should be at least a weak tie. It should not be the case that um, there is no edge between them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So if it's weak or strong, it's fine. Hmm. Yeah. Correct. So, so what I can say is that. I can say the converse of it, which says that look, a, a node will is violating. That means somebody is behaving contrary to expected. If somebody is having two close friends and is not bothering to introduce them, that means this guy is violating what I would consider a social norm. Right? I'm saying the same thing in different words. And we can say so this strong triadic closure property has to be checked where? It has to be checked at every vertex, every node. And we will say, who has to satisfy this? Not the graph. A node has to satisfy it. And we can say by extension that a graph is satisfying it if every node in the graph is satisfying it. Is that clear? So, is that clear? Or did I confuse you guys? We want to check the strong triadic closure property at every vertex in the graph. Now, I go to every vertex. I see that this guy has three friends, three strong links. 
Then what do I have to check? I look at these two. Is a weak link there? Yes. I look at these two. Weak link there? Yes. I look at these two. Weak link there? Yes. Then this guy is satisfying it. So I go to every vertex in the graph one after the other. For e at each vertex when I stand, I look at all the strong links. Suppose it has k strong links. Then I have to check for kc2 pairs of friends. See that they at least have a weak link. If they have at least a weak link, strong is okay, weak is okay. But at least if that's there, then ah, okay, good. This guy passes the strong radic closure property. Then I move to the next one. Clear? Yeah. Right? So here, each edge is labeled as strong or weak to indicate the strength of the relationship. Right? And now we will try to combine a couple of notions and, and just bear with me as we do that. When I go and ask somebody, right, is this a friend or an acquaintance? So that person will say, this is strong tie or a weak tie. That's, that's a local, that's a, that's a question that weak or strong is a question I'm asking at every vertex to every person. And they are saying, this is weak, this is strong. So this is a local notion. Local bridge, contrary to its name, is actually a global notion. Global why? Because if I cut this edge, I have to check, oh, is the path there or is the path of length 22 or 87 or what? So I'm bringing two concepts. One is a local concept. Please tell me, strong. Please tell me, weak. This is local. So the weak tie or strong tie is coming from local at every vertex. But if I want to check whether somebody is a local bridge, if an edge is a local bridge, for this I have to do a global computation. If I cut this edge, I have to traverse the graph and see what is the shortest path between the edge that I just cut. And that may actually take me through every other vertex in the graph. So computing this is not a local phenomenon. Computing whether something is a local bridge is actually a graph-wide phenomenon. You get it? Yeah. So one is a local computation, the other is a global computation. Global because not every time it will become as big as a graph, but it can. So you have to, but this is clearly local because I can definitely get the answer at the vertex. Okay. Now what we are going to try to do is we are going to try to see a connection between these two things. And again, just bear with me. What's the connection? Okay. The claim is that if a node in the network satisfies the STC property, okay, then no, it's saying that then any local bridge that it is involved in, that local bridge should be a weak tie. Let me say that again. So suppose I have two friends, they're both strong links. Between them, I could have a strong link, end of story. Okay, But suppose I actually am connected to some guy with whom this thing is actually a local bridge. Why is it a local bridge? Because if I cut it, my distance to that fellow is going to become 5. Okay, Then this edge could not have been a strong link. That's the claim. Once again, what is the claim? That suppose I am I am a good node. Good node meaning I am satisfying STC. Okay, that means that for every pair of strong friends I have, I am ensuring that they are at least acquainted, they are at least a weak link. For these two strongest, this is a strong link. I have done my job perfectly correctly, so I am satisfying STC. Okay, now it turns out that I have a local bridge. Yeah. Strictly more than two. Direct edge. Okay. There is a direct edge. Hmm. When I cut that, yeah. the path should become three or more. Okay. Right? So now what I am saying? I am saying that I have done my job. I am satisfying STC. But by the way, I have a weak, I, I am part of a local bridge, not, not a weak link. I am having a local bridge with him. Then this local bridge must be a weak link. 
This is what we have to prove. But I wanted to make sure that we understand the statement. I could have strong, weak, strong. Everywhere I have strong, they are connected by at least weak. Somewhere too strong, they have strong. All this is done. Now, I have one link which is in fact a local bridge. Why is it a local bridge? Because if I cut it, the distance goes up to 6. Then, then this should have been, must have been a weak link. The statement is clear? Yes. Statement is clear? Statement is clear, right? Now we'll see how, why that is to be. So, so suppose a has two strong links, right? Now, if A has two strong links with B and C, okay, and I am saying that A is satisfying triadic closure, right? Then that means that BC, right? Okay, what are we looking at? Let us look at the edge AB. Yeah, I should tell you where we are focusing. Our focus is on AB. Okay. Let us look at the AB. What are we saying? I am saying that if it is a local bridge, it must be a weak tie. The converse of that is if it is a strong tie, it cannot be a local bridge. Converse of the same. P implies Q is equal to not Q implies not P. We remember that. So, what we are trying to prove is that if AB is a strong tie, then AB cannot be a local bridge. How do we prove this? Because we prove it as follows, right? If it was then, uh, then B and C would have at least a weak link. So right, exactly, right. So now what happens? So now what, what I'm saying? Yeah, sorry. What yeah. Is, uh, apart from the strong link between A and B, which we are taking now to be strong, what if all the other links were weak? Exactly. So that's why we are saying that A should have at least two strong links. At least two strong links. You're right. Otherwise, I can trivially not have it. But uh, but but that's that's true. Yeah. So what happens is that if A is having at least two strong links and it is satisfying STC, then this guy cannot be a, a a local bridge is that clear let me let me let me complete it formally okay now ab is a strong link now the fact that a is satisfying stc and we are saying that it has at least two strong links that means there is some other strong link to some guy let's call it f then by definition since a is satisfying it then b should be connected to some f but if B is connected to some F, then when I cut AB, the path between A to B will go through F. So, it will only become 2. It can't become 3 or more. So, not possible. That's the argument. Okay. Alright. So, so what did we do? Well, we just made a connection between a local property and a global property. What is the connection we made? We said that I am asking this question personally, friend, acquaintance, strong, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. From there, I am trying to connect it with the thing of something being a bridge. Right? So, we are now making arguments and we are able to make these extensions that if this is what people are talking about strong and weak links, then that means at I am asking something which is very local and then I am trying to connect to a, to a phenomenon which is actually global. And I'm making this connection. Okay, all right. So here, here this is what we when we started out with this topic. This is what we are saying. So now by making some things about local, we are actually able to make guesses or predictions about what the global thing should look like. This is exactly what we are saying. Here's an example of that, right? So. This is actually saying how interpersonal things is actually so how you and I are interacting and making friends and all is deciding 
whether some local bridge can even get created or not at the global situation. Isn't that amazing? Are you with me? Right? So we are saying that if individual nodes or vertices, people are behaving in a certain way and they are all behaving locally, that is deciding whether somewhere a bridge is going to get built or not, which is a purely global thing which no single guy is actually controlling. That's the interesting thing. Yeah? So, just to summarize, Granovitz's problem did two things. Number one, it talked about things being strong and weak. Yeah, we didn't get into what makes weak friendship. We didn't get into, but you get the idea, right? So that's what we're talking about. Uh, so what it, what it did is it, it, it made a connection between these local things of friend versus acquaintance. And it talked about how uh, the structure of the network, you know, where a local bridge will lie or not lie, it actually gets decided by that. Right? So, what did we learn? One number one is that STCP turned out to be like a useful uh, uh, definition, right? Importantly, we came up with this idea of local bridge, which was uh, not as strict as a bridge, so we relaxed the definition, right? Uh, but we are aware that it is computationally a little bit expensive if I have to find compute local bridges because that requires global computation. So as people who are in computing over here, we have to be especially, all of us actually, I have to be sensitive to that. Okay. Now, and this is more of a social statement perhaps, but I will just read it out to you. I am really sorry about the font being so small. Um, what it tells us really, and back to Granovitz's problem is that uh, social ties connect us to opportunities and some of these acquaintances are where this interesting or new information actually comes from, right? So in that sense, in that sense we are also saying that if the interesting information is actually flowing to us through local bridges, because all of us who are meeting every day we have nothing new to share, right? So remember we talked in the earlier slides also about how information flows in a network. Now we are even making some general comments about that, that this information is flowing. I mean, of course, it's rapidly flowing among the closed network, but interesting and not that easy to find is actually flowing, the one that's flowing across the local bridges. Now, um, weak connections are, of course, weak connections are, one is it's an acquaintance, but you can realize how weak connections are important because all local bridges which are enabling this information to flow are actually weak links. So amazing. What is amazing is all the important stuff that is flowing to you is not flowing through strong links but rather through weak links, right? And so that, that you know, this is kind of said by these guys that that is the surprising strength of weak ties, yeah? So that's what's cool about, about the weak ties. So, but this is not the end of the story, yeah? Oops, I'm sorry, I've eaten into your break. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll continue this at some later point, yeah? I lost track of time. Uh, it may take a few more minutes. How many of you are okay to continue? How many say that you're okay to continue? Don't have to say yes because of pressure. <laughs> That's social pressure, see, so, social pressure right there. Okay, I'll, I'll try to wrap this up real quick, okay? So, uh, so what happened was that Granovita did this like, you know, more than 100 years back, right? But so, this was all theory. And so the question was, well, can we, can we validate this in practice? And, and, of course, now we have digital communication, we have phones and people have data. And so, Onela et al. from Finland actually did a very interesting study. Okay. So they said they wanted to study this thing exactly. But they went again, they did a, so remember how we went from bridges to local bridges? Why? Because that was too stringent. So we came up with a new definition. But this new definition is computationally tight, difficult. So these guys made a smart redefinition of that. They relaxed that to make sure that 
computationally it becomes easy to do. So, in, so for the local bridge part, they said let's look at neighborhood overlap as a measure of how much of a local bridge something is. Okay. So, what are they saying? They are saying that um, if I look at an edge between A and B, okay, I will say how much of a local bridge it is based by seeing how many common neighbors it has divided by the union of neighbors the endpoints have. If this is a small number, it means it is a better local bridge. If there are many common neighbors, it means not that good a local bridge. Make sense? Now suddenly, instead of actually checking whether this path length is becoming 5 or more, or this, I can replace this with a purely local computation. That is like super clever. right? So this thing which about something which was becoming a global, global computation, this guy said, okay, let us be smart and change it to making it a local computation and by just looking at the neighborhood overlap of the endpoints. Make sense? Okay. And then this is what they did. They got the data and they actually made this plot. And what this plot basically says is that as overlap increases, the tie strength also increases, which is the same way as overlap, overlap increases means it is less and less of a local bridge and it is a stronger and stronger tie and they proved it. Yeah. So instead of being 0, 1, they made it on a, on a 0, 2, 1 scale and they were able to show that look, anything that is a strong tie is not a good local bridge at all and they showed this. Yeah. What I want you guys to especially take home is the fact of how we started with a mathematically strict definition, relaxed it to make sense in a practical setting and then to compute it, we again found a proxy to make it tractable. Yeah? That is the brilliance of this two papers. The y axis is showing how much overlap it has. Overlap means how much of a local bridge it is. So, so if I have two, so let us say I am looking at one edge. If the if I am looking at an edge, it has two endpoints. So, number of common neighbors divided by union of neighbors of A and B. Right? So, as that increases, I am finding the tie strength is also increasing. How did, it, how did they calculate tie strength? How many times are you calling each other? So, if you are calling each other a lot, it is a strong tie. If you are calling each other less, it is a weak tie. So, this is a local thing because I have to ask you, is it strong, is it strong? So, how do I find a proxy? I cannot ask everybody. So, I will say, okay, how many number of calls you make in a day or what is the total duration? I am getting that for the local part and for the local bridge part, I am looking at common friends. So, this is what they did. Right? I think this is a, this is a good place to stop. Okay? Thank you very much, guys.